Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, an inspired conversation space between Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner on the journey of motherhood through the common thread of parenting, relationship, and sexuality as a path to consciousness. We keep our conversations honest, our experiences real, and our philosophies exploratory. We believe that in order to raise incredible humans, we first have to raise ourselves. We know that in order to rock the family, you've got to nourish the mother. If you are here, you care about paving a path of conscious and intentional motherhood, connected with yourself and your gifts, and also illuminating your children in theirs so we may raise more whole humans who can impact this world in a more humane way. If you desire to integrate your learnings practically and supportively, head on over to bridgetwood.life or julietenner.love to go deeper. And for all live streamed, pre release podcasts and all our free content, head over to our free Facebook group, Nourishing the Mother with Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner. We are Julie Tenner and Bridget Wood, and we are so grateful you're here. Hello and welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Bridget Wood. And I'm Julie Tenner. And today's podcast is when you feel like the black sheep in your family, which I imagine (laughs) most of us could identify with, being that we are a collection of alternative thinkers. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I think that this will be a magnificent conversation around how do we navigate feeling and being in alignment with our difference whilst maintaining relationship and connection with particularly families of origin. So this is inspired by a beautiful listener's email, which we will read, though keep her anonymous. And we just want to say a huge thank you for the vulnerability that we're fully aware it takes just to reach out and say there's this thing. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you just to open it up. So thank you to that listener too. And if you find yourself in that place, please, please reach out. So we would love to be able to meet you exactly where you're at. Yeah. So Bridget, are you going to read the email to us? I will. Dear Bridget and Julie, I have tried to write this email six times but have not been able to get it down to a few sentences. So I have just sent as is. Hopefully you can tease something out. I was wondering if you could do an episode about extended families and family of origin. I am currently struggling with the cultural differences between my family and my family of origin, specifically disrespect and maintaining relationship with non-conscious family. My mother, the head of the family, and my sister don't respect my husband. They would deny it, but it's there. Additionally, I don't feel understood or that I'm always respected. We are both black sheep, constantly questioning the status quo, trying to live by our values and applying consciousness to as much of our lives as we can. My family of origin are not this way. They don't ask questions at gatherings, they don't approach with curiosity, and they don't get us or try to get us. I have been code switching since I was a teenager with family and friends to try and fit in and not upset people with my intensity, aka my introspection and attempts to evolve. I have also allowed my husband to be disrespected in the past. We have been together 16 years because I'm the joker of the family and in my immaturity thought it was harmless. I have owned up to this with my husband. My husband is a tall poppy and has always stood out. He refuses to be less for my family or to be inauthentic, especially because of what that models to our children. I completely agree. I wish my family could love him for who he is. COVID has brought to the fore our differences and the disrespect my family has for my husband and would have for me if I had been more outspoken in the past. It's a subtle disrespect and lack of genuine care, so difficult to confront I would like advice on how to claim my power in a feminine way without being aggressive, cold, or justifying or explaining us away. I have tried to help them understand me for years. I still don't feel understood or respected. I have no idea how to navigate these relationships going forward. I'm on the precipice of evolution to become stronger and I'm really struggling with it. I don't want confrontation. My family doesn't handle it well. And I don't think I have the right to ask them to change themselves or evolve alongside me. 
but I don't like what putting up with this treatment communicates to my kids as they grow. Again, I thank you so much for even reading this and apologise for how long-winded it is. I feel very vulnerable spilling myself out in an email this way. Your podcast has made such an impact on my life and the life of my family. Thank you both. I just like I well up with tears oh, at the end of it. Me too. Yeah, because I realise the courage and the vulnerability and often even the pain that pours out with words like that. To, for you to send that to us, dear listener, uh, we would love to open that up um, in a conversation and hopefully offer you some pearls of wisdom to help you move forward. Yeah. Oh, heck yes. There's so many places I want to take this conversation. I kind of want to preface it with I think this is entirely um on point if there can be such thing in the collective consciousness because just this morning I've just come out of my honey club space where I've been facilitating a conversation. I had Tara Braun come in and facilitate a really hard conversation. So just this morning we've spent an hour and a half in honey club looking at literally exactly this. How perfect. Yeah, how perfect. Yeah, for this one. Well, I just love it because it makes me, it really hits home to me how, how incredibly important it is, and this is why I love Tara's work, to consider and to be the modelling of having hard conversations whilst maintaining relationship. Mm. Because what we tend to assume is that if I have a hard conversation, there's a fracture in our relationship. So we can't stay in relationship with each other and have hard conversations. Yeah, it's almost like they're mutually exclusive. Right. Mm. Versus we can't be in relationship, true, authentic, deep connection without being able to have hard conversations. Yeah. Be that with our children, with our lovers and partners, with our family, with our culture, with our community. Like they're all forces that have cultural systems that create certain narratives within us, right? So how do we navigate ourselves through living in greater alignment, greater heart-opened connection and do better for humanity? Yeah. Amen. Rather than, yeah, rather than avoiding the thing because we perceive we won't have love. Yeah. Or that we'll cause harm. Yeah. Yeah. Which was one of the points I wrote down here. There, there was a couple that I probably just want to pull out to start with. Are you okay with that, Bridge? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So one of the beautiful points that I want to pull out, which I think is one that we can't have enough, particularly as a collection of, I mean, you and I are both women of white privilege. Mm -hmm. so often what we assume is because we see the world differently that that's enough rather than actually doing the work Mm -hmm. which means there's cost involved financially energy time wise emotional wise to actually look at the systems that have created the beliefs and the narratives that you randomly see spring out of you Mm -hmm. and then to be held in accountability, so personal account- accountability. What does it look like to no longer tolerate microaggressions mm. because they are harmful? Your silence is harming. So the perception that in saying something I'm creating harm and in not saying something I'm not creating harm is white privilege. Mm. And ultimately false because... To not say something is also harmful. It's exactly right because you're harming the peoples for whom that derogatory comment has been made. Mm -hmm. By not saying something, it's not the job of the people who are harmed to go, hey, I'm calling you person in power out on your whatever it is, racist comment or Mm -hmm. harming, harmful comment. It's the job of, of us, those people in power, to say no. That's not okay. So microaggressions are literally where we don't say and we let the harm exist or where we use humour to, I don't know, 
move through something rather than actually being with the thing that's hard. Mm. And I think it's the microaggressions that are like death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. It's still a death and you let it happen every day. Like the collective you, I'm saying me as well, I'm involved in these systems of oppression, right, by virtue of the fact that I'm part of this culture. Mm. So I'm really sitting with, and the conversation that we all really sat with in Honey Club today was how much we all thought or that a large majority of our collective thinks by saying nothing that we're doing the work. Mm. But we're not. That's not how a system changes. No, because because by saying nothing, you're that's you're complicit in the perpetuation of that system and that dynamic, right? So, bringing it back to this question, the, the, these listeners' questions, by saying nothing and wanting to avoid the confrontation, it's like saying yes to it continuing. Right. Exactly. So, why that gets really hard is because we assume that to be understood is necessary. And it's not. Yeah. And to be in connection means to be seen in a favourable light. And that isn't part of the deal in having relationship as well. So we've the, what I can hear in these words also is the perception that I can only enter this if they still hold me in a favourable light. Yeah. But you can hold yourself in that deep love and maintain connection through what is bringing up their shadow and awkwardness and hardness, you can love someone through their shadow. Mm. I imagine the same way this listener loves her children through theirs. Yeah. She doesn't only love them, I imagine, particularly if she's a long-time listener of ours, when they see her as a loving mum. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Or when they're cooperative or when they're nice to their sibling. It's not conditional. Yeah. Yeah, I can love all of you because I see how all of you exist in me too. Mm. Mm. We're not oppositional. So I think that they were two fundamental um, differences of perception, I suppose, that I wanted to begin with. And then I wanted to bring in exactly what you had said, Bridge, around not wanting confrontation. Mm. And I think that that speaks to this point too, is that we assume hard conversations have to be confrontational in some way. And I don't know that they have to be. I really don't. I'm not sure that I think if we move into righteousness, they can get confrontational because now my ego is battling your ego. Yeah, and it becomes defensive very quickly. Yeah, if it's coming from a place of righteousness, I know better, I need to teach you. Mm. Versus I can love you and offer whatever it is that helps you understand and transform yeah which can just be one step beyond where you are it doesn't have to be everything at once Mm. so how we approach those people and those conversations has a lot to do with the end result right are we approaching with righteousness Mm. or are we approaching with deep love I don't I love you I know you to be I know that your values are. I mean, this is something that Tara talks about so consistently. You and I have both been in her learning spaces. So, and we talk about it here in terms of conscious parenting. What is the framework that says, I see you, I know you are this human. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know, but this part is what's just come out. And here's what it is, like name it, right? Name it to tame it. And it's harmful in these ways. And here's, you know, you can move on from there if you want to, but depends on where you're at. So I don't know that confrontation always has to be um, defensive. Mm. And it's okay for you, me, whoever, to be in bodily discomfort as we meet new edges that's okay because unfortunately the reason that we navigate away from those 
harder conversations that are bigger paradigm shifting moments are because we're too stuck in our own white fragility. I don't want to feel that level of discomfort. So I'll avoid the thing. Yeah. That is white fragility. I see it in myself. And honestly, sometimes it makes me sick, mm-hmm. but I'm part of a system. I've been conditioned for generations. It exists in my DNA. Yeah, Yeah. and and also we've learned on a subtle level that to be able to be um, to exist or survive in this system, that that's what gets you there. Like that's how you get to be seen, included, and participate in that system is to play that role, which is why unwiring that behaviour can be it is lifelong I think for all of us and so it's you know bringing enormous compassion to ourselves as we practice that and also to those who we're in relationship with Mm. which brings us back to the self-righteousness piece which can come up a lot when we perceive that we are you know the conscious ones the ones seeking to evolve quickly the ones who are doing the work and the powerful and humbling thing is, is to look at, okay, well, where am I not doing the work? Mm-hmm. Where are my edges? And to can reconsider labelling yourself the black sheep and consider yourself as the balancer mm-hmm. because the family has all parts and the more one way some members of the family are, the more incomplete parallel opposite has to be the other. So it's not simply you that is creating your role. It's co-created within that family. And as you you imagine kind of you moving a little bit more toward that dysregulation in your own body that kind of says, I don't want confrontation, I feel judged, you know, I feel all these things that feel hard. The more you move toward that edge and slightly past that edge, the more it's actually going to bring that family closer to you. If you approach it in a way that is not, you're this, you're that, you can't, I won't, in an attacking, confrontational way. Mm. The more you come into the centre and humble yourself and kind of offer your yourself as a change maker from a place of humility the more they can meet you in that space because the more we hold on to our difference the bigger our difference is Mm. Mm. what do you think from a universal perspective on avoiding confrontation Mm. Well, I think it's kind of that, um, it's like the more you sweep it under the rug, the more lumpy the rug is and the bigger it gets because whatever you're avoiding, you're eventually going to run into. You can't continue to avoid it. Mm. So you're likely avoiding it to the degree that they're avoiding it. And so if you start to move toward it, you're simultaneously going to invite them to move toward it. Now, how skilled they are at moving toward that in a non-confrontational way, in a way that can take self-ownership of their co-creation of it, that's beside the point. But you are going to invite them into that. Mm. And then it's up to you to notice the parts of you that perhaps feel like the way that they're meeting you is condescending or is disrespectful or is not taking ownership of their perspective and their values. And that's where you invite the hard conversation and the framework of conversation that Julie just outlined, which doesn't say, you know, the whole laundry list of things, but it begins with one thing based on one example of a time where you might have felt disrespected or unheard and how you would love for them to meet you next time so that you give them a, you know, a, a framework or an outcome that you desire. It's not the this one thing means that for 20 years you haven't been able to understand me. Mm. Start with the one thing. Mm. 
Yes. I, I deeply believe that that we all want to meet each other. Mm. We really do. But it's all of the conditioning and the hurt and the pain in the way of that that comes up and says, oh, no, they can't meet me. It's too hard. We're too different. Mm. That, that, that is what's, it, it's, it's, the, it's the layers of walls up that say that. Because ultimately, I mean, the family is one of the most powerful tools for our own growth mm. because they reflect us and they balance us in sometimes some of the most painful ways because we're designed to have the exact polar opposite somewhere in our family. Mm. So in actual fact, the fact that you are living your life as in alignment as you are is also part of the gift from them because had they taken up some of the space of consciousness, you wouldn't have. Yeah, you would it have would probably be more balanced. You would, you would be less so. More, you know, a bit more autopilot, a bit more in the mainstream, a bit more accepting of the status quo. Mm. But because they've kind of in that place for Klein and Sinker, you've taken up the complete opposite space which is actually for the evolution of the whole Mm. you are still pulling the family forward like the the black sheep or the balancer is purposeful because even if the others in that family resist that it still pulls them forward because it's an evolutionary function Mm. that person is critically important to that family because that person is also often the one that takes on the responsibility for changing family patterns Mm-hmm. and therefore changing epigenetic markers. Mm. Like it's really big. It is. And big. painful. <laughs> yeah. Well, the human lived experience of that is the pain and the suffering. Right? Yeah. But revelation is never born out of comfort. Mm. It's born on that edge and beyond. Yeah, right. Right. Mm. The other place that I kind of wanted to go here was one of the um, sentences in there, which was, I don't know how to have this conversation where I claim my power, but in a feminine way Mm -hmm. without aggression being cold, justifying or explaining away. So I totally understand what she's saying, but I also think we have part of the patriarchal notions intertwined with that, which is another instance where we see how we are conditioned rather than it being this thing that exists outside of us because the very fact that you don't want to be aggressive, I mean, that is the feminine wound, right? (laughs) Don't stand in your power because then you're a bitch. Totally. And we don't like nasty women. Oh, God, no. We can't be in relationship with nasty women. Mm. So don't go near that thing. Mm. Like that is the system. Totally. So So part of that is loving your aggression. Like where where is your aggression a gift and something that deeply serves you in your life, not something that you somehow need to regulate yourself for so that you don't be that? Yeah, because right? it's not okay to be that. Yeah. Because okay. damage and death and disaster are going to happen if you're that. Mm. So don't go there. That literally is the patriarchy inside of you. Mm. This is why I'm always banging on about it. And it is confronting depending on where you, how you perceive yourself. Yeah. But the systems of oppression and power exist within you, not just outside of you, though the more you make them outside of you, the less you see them inside of you. And I think that's a more dangerous place to be. Absolutely. It reminds me of that, um, oh, my God, is it Rumi? At first I was clever and I wanted to change the world. Now I am wise and I'm changing myself. Yeah, I don't know who that is, but I know that. I think it's Rumi maybe, but it's ultimately saying we think so much that the things we have to fix and change and remedy is everything outside of us, but it only becomes possible and sustainable if we're also looking at the same time, where am I that? How can I channel my expression of that? to be more healthy, right, rather than potentially hurtful. But I will always be that which I see outside of me. And the more it pains me outside of me, the more unloved it is inside of me. Mm, Amen. So that work for women on aggression 
for women who are struggling with the embodiment of that? The aggression and the cold, right? So you've got you've got both in this sentence. How do I do it without being aggressive and cold like a total bitch? Mm. And how do I do it without justifying and explaining away because I'm the peacemaker and the doormat? Yeah. Like you've got both in that sentence. It's like that too much or not enough thing, right? Like you can never win, so don't go near your power. Oh, that's that's got a lot on it, doesn't it? You can never win. So don't go near your power. Like you can't win, right, because you're always too much or not enough. And if I keep you really focused on how you'll be too much or not enough and both of those are places you don't want to be, then you're not going to go near it, are you? Yeah. We're just interrupting the podcast on when you feel like the black sheep in your family to let you know what we've all got going on at the moment. And, Bridgie, what can we jump into? Coming up is Disrupt, Revealing the Mother Wound. So we will delve deep into many of the concepts in this podcast as part of that course. It's a five-week container to really develop both your inner mother, your mother, and your relationship with your own mother. So it's an unraveling and an expansion of your motherhood, which I'm really excited for. And how do we find that? Yes, uh, you go to bridgetwood.life. And what have you got coming up, Jules? You can jump into Honey Club at any time and I've got Lover's School coming up in about another four weeks, so stay tuned for that at julietenner.love. Yeah, much, much easier to stay in this kind of <laughs> middle, middle grey of acceptability for the system that you exist in. Yes, yeah, it's so busy. It's not entirely fulfilling. In fact, it's probably deeply depleting, but you're accepted there. Yeah. And this is part of what I love. And you and I've had this conversation often is for all of the ways that you perceive you don't conform, you are to an equal extent conforming. Yes. I love that reminder. Yeah. Because I've had to, this is how I've humbled my own self-righteousness is by continuously asking myself this question, because I can perceive myself as the outlier. I can, like you, I'm sure Bridge, and by all means you talk after me, Um, I can perceive myself as the black sheep, the one who, you know, I mean, let's talk about the systems I've stepped outside of, nearly all of them, stepped outside of the education system, I've stepped outside of the health system, I've stepped outside of the birth system, I've stepped outside of the career system, I've stepped outside of, (laughs) I can't even think now, so many systems. (laughs) And then so I can be like, I'm like, I'm not a conformer, I'm like this, you know, wild woman in the world And then I'm like, fuck, where are you equally conforming? Mm. Because for every bit I'm not, I am. Where am I towing the line? Plenty of places. Well, yeah, Yeah. where am I I not speaking out? Where am I quietening my own voice? Where am I trying to fit in? Yeah, where am I conforming? Where am I, you know, following predictable patterns? Yeah. Like getting married and having children and staying together between, you know, all of these ways that. She's in a heterosexual relationship, absolutely. Yeah. Getting married, staying together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, having children, definitely conforming. Conforming to systems of power like we have in the COVID system here. Yeah. Right? Like I'm still choosing to conform to that. Mm. Um, I'm trying to think now. I did a whole list on this when I was like, fuck, I'm really conforming. Conforming to alternative dogmas. Because exactly right. Like, do you swing so far from like Western medicine to yeah. the opposite? They're just two sides of the same thing. <laughs> I mean, you swing, we, we, we perceive pain and problems and collapse and destruction and, you know, lack of evolution, right, in one particular system and want to be almost like radical and anarchists away from that system. So then we go to its complete opposite. But that it also has dogma. Yeah and you know prescriptions of how you have to live yes so it's conscious parenting groups yes yes you're still conforming to someone or something outside of inherently you Mm -hmm. it's still a system yeah and to fuck the system is almost a system yeah (laughs) it is of go of of like disregarding all of that so i can be over here and on the right path but it also has its, I mean, we, we cannot escape the challenge and we cannot escape the dysfunction. 
And so the humbling part of looking at where we do conform and not conform, we then get to go, okay, well, where do I actually authentically want to play? Mm. I know I can't avoid conforming. Mm. So where is my power and my alignment in how I want to conform? Mm. And how can I not judge the other for where I perceive that they're conforming? Because I know that where I choose to conform is because it's deeply meaningful to me, Mm. to my purpose and to my mission. And can I feel that same level of reverence for difference? Yeah. Rather than asking the people that I love to be the same in order for me to be okay. Mm. Mm. We just have to get better at loving with difference. And loving people where they are. Yeah. Because spirituality is not something that you have or do or get when you meditate or you have an interest in natural medicine or crystals or consciousness. Every single person is a spiritual person Mm. in their true values. Mm. So the corporate high-flying businessman who, you know, is a ultra capitalist, Mm. he's highly spiritual. That's his expression of his spirituality. So I think we need to humble ourselves too where we otherize in such a way that we make something bad because as soon as we label it, we're just not understanding it. Mm. Yeah, totally, totally. And at the same time, how do we honour ourselves? Like Mm. in this example, particularly like I imagine myself being in her position and this is my husband. Mm. It would be a no-go boundary for me. I, like that's not how boundaries don't forget. Um, uh, I'm just having a flashback to Honeycutt this morning. I had this beautiful woman in there who has worked with me for a number of years and she had this beautiful reflection on what has been deeply meaningful for her in navigating tricky conversations with family. And for her it was the realisation that boundaries are not these hard, you know, covered in shards of glass, ouchy, painful staunch things that either you conform to or you get hurt by Mm. that boundaries get to be these beautiful like you know waves of butterflies and you know rose gardens and things that let the other person know how to love you well Mm. so if you're not willing to put forward these are the boundaries these are actually how you can love me really well Mm then you're not really in a deep and authentic relationship anyway. So I just think letting people know, particularly if it was my family, that I love you. I know that relationship is a really high value for you. I've watched you parent us through our whole lives and that's been hugely important to you. I can see how you've devoted your life to to loving us. Mm. So I know that this is painful for you. But this thing, insert the thing that was said or done, is harmful for these reasons. It's this thing. It's racist. It's what I say what it is. Don't beat around the bush. It's this for these reasons. Mm. And I can no longer, you can go with this or not, I can no longer tolerate that. I can't. I'm asking you to love me and my husband, and that includes not saying these things in our presence or in our home. Mm. So I think it's completely, completely necessary to inform our family of how they can best love us Mm. because it's in the way of relationship anyway, right? Like the very thing you think you're avoiding and by avoiding seeking connection isn't connection anyhow. Mm. Like you're actually running into the thing that you think you're avoiding. Yeah. Isn't that a paradox, right? Yeah, right. Like what you run from, you run into anyway. Mm -hmm. You're already experiencing the disconnection with self because it's out of integrity and alignment for who you know yourself to be or becoming. Mm. And it's in the way of deep, authentic relating with your family. And on that boundary piece too, expect remembering that they're your boundaries, that you are responsible for upholding and that those people may need continual reminders of what they look like and feel like because they're in your values and we often 
aren't that great at honouring and speaking to other people's values. And so to be in relationship well with people as you're seeking to shift boundaries or shift ways of being, it's going to require of you cultivation of grace as that person adapts to what you're asking of them. Mm. A little bit like when we teach our children, they don't just learn to brush their teeth one time. They're requiring us to show up for them twice a day, every day, to guide them on what that looks like and to be patient when they don't want to or when that's hard and to love them through it. And so similarly, holding our boundary with someone on what is okay or not okay to be spoken about or or referenced is going to require that. And maybe sometimes we'll be firmer and clearer if they're disregarding it. But if it is an honest mistake simply because of the pattern of the way things have been for so long, because yeah. we've allowed that, like we've, we've co-created that. And also they probably won't see it because it's the soup they're swimming in. Yeah, we don't see the soup we're swimming in because it's all the ingredients are mixed together and it's all just this one big thing. Mm. We don't see our patterns anywhere near as much as we see other people's because they're ours. Their reality as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly for people who are not used to looking at their stuff or not used to questioning, then it's even more so. Mm. Yeah. And I think particularly if it's in spaces of family and you have your children around, that it's so important that, one, they see that role modelling and they learn how to move outside of a system by virtue of seeing that there's something flawed in that system or else if we just move through it, they become the system anyway. Yeah. But there's no pattern interrupt there to bring greater awareness. Yeah, and they're, they're to question the system that they're in. Because yeah. if, if you can't, remembering that the family is the, is, the, is the practice for being in society and being in the broader world. And so if you don't have and create safety for the pattern interrupt in the family system and the, and the honest conversation in the family system, in the immediate family, mm-hmm. then... Kids don't grow up thinking I get to change stuff out there. It's just the way it is. Yeah, totally. And in the systems that harm, there's harm to the person like this listener's husband and there's ripples of harm outside of that. Mm. Do your children experience versions of harm in that that need to be met, addressed, spoken to and with and for? Mm. Have you? So... I get that it's super fucking hard. I really like hear how hard that is. I don't think that it's easeful. But I also think the more we do conscious work, the better we get at holding ourselves in discomfort Mm. rather than perceiving that we're only okay when we're in comfort. Like this is the point of nervous system regulation and conscious questions that balance the polarizations happening in your body and your mind. Mm. And this is what it looks like to walk a path of deep authenticity. It's not fucking easeful. Mm. What is easier is to be silent and just keep swimming. Yeah. And hoping you might get to new vistas someday. Mm. The far harder path in actual fact is to walk your soul's truth right? Like that's harder. Somehow culturally or pop culture, we, we just go, oh, you know, be authentic, follow your soul. But I don't know how many of us are actually doing the work of that. Yeah. Because this is what it looks like. How do I meet my own discomfort in what this very co-creation brings up, which is in actual fact, the system that I'm trying to dismantle? Mm. And how do I hold myself in that discomfort and find my voice Mm. that is literally healing lineages of women and suppression that has existed for thousands of years? Mm. Every time you choose your voice, you are healing the feminine pain, Mm. suffering. So powerful. Right. Every time, Mm. every time you're seen, every time you're willing to be seen. 
Mm-hmm. Every time you choose your voice, you're doing it not just for you, but all of the women that have come before you, the generations of harm that have existed that you're now giving voice to mm-hmm. or acknowledging the pain of. That is like, I mean, that is the work, right? Mm-hmm. And on that point too, I mean, how is this for your family? Mm. Right? Like when we talk about healing the feminine, how is this leaning toward discomfort and leaning toward changing how you relate in your family actually a gift to that family mm. that is helpful to your mother and does things for her she couldn't do for herself? Because as long as we think it's going to be bad or negative or in some way hurtful to them, we can often stop the actually important and valuable work that is moving toward them, Mm. having those conversations, setting those boundaries. When you perceive it's only a drawback versus how is it of service to them and you and actually on the way for for what you want and desire. Yeah. Yeah, so beautiful. It's such important work, isn't and it? And part of it is also looking back into your past because we'll often have a belief that our family doesn't like confrontation because of our past experience of bringing them something and them struggling with that. So for me, like some of my work has certainly been going back to my teenage years where I perceive I went off the rails or, or I caused pain to my mother and looking at her life then and looking at how for her it could not have been another way and that it was just what she needed at that time in her life for me to be going through that and behaving in that way Mm. because it was stretching her and she was needing to face herself and her relationship with my dad might have needed me to be challenging to bring them together. Mm. There's a system, an unseen system that needs challenge from children or from different parents to help the whole system evolve Mm. and as long as we label ourselves as wrong or um, hold shame and guilt for those experiences we're not seeing the wholeness of those experiences that's the distortion that's that we're holding on to to avoid our own pain essentially. And so part of it is looking at how can I become more comfortable in my own dysregulation? Mm -hmm. How can I hold myself instead of expecting others to hold me through conflict? Mm -hmm. And how can I love them through what feels hard? Oh, gosh, I just love everything about that so hard. I actually feel like that is the crux of growing up. Yeah. Is actually being able to hold yourself yeah. through hard stuff without needing the world or other people to, to be changed. Yep. Yeah. yeah. To change around you. Yeah. Like how, that is the work, right? Like how do you be the youest you, not protected, not guarded, mm. just you? Mm. and hold yourself in that. And also recognise too that that if you are on this consciousness path or this desiring of your own spiritual growth, that you're not only choosing light Mm. because if you try that on, you can welcome some family conflict (laughs) and you will make them the problem but they are just your shadow. They're just your shadow and they're there for you to love. Because it will come out another form, right? Like wh- whoever is challenging you right now, how can you say thank you? Mm. Which is brutal when you're in the challenge. Yeah, it's brutal. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying also you don't get to choose a one-sided experience. Yeah, totes. 100% hear that. 100% hear that. So I guess let's maybe just do a quick wrap up on starting points for this beautiful listener, because you and I both want her to have an experience of self that's more um, revered, perhaps Mm. the word. Mm. 
that's just held by her as sacred so that she has the capacity to enter it. Mm. So what I would love to offer you is that you sharing of your authentic self from a place of heartness, from a place of in connection with the hurt rather than in connection with the inner rebel or the inner teenager or the inner one that wants to fight or bargain her way out of something rather than in connection with the strategies. How do you be in connection with just an open-hearted, the hurt that that sentence creates for the people for whom that sentence is speaking about, the hurt that that creates for someone that you love dearly Mm -hmm. and speaking from that place, I love you, mum, sister. I know that you are people of deep integrity. I know that you are kind and loving people. But this, this part, that hurts. Mm. And I can't have that here anymore because it's harmful in these ways, because it hurts in these ways. Mm. And if you'd like to have a conversation about that, I'd love to have a conversation with you but I can't have that around my kids anymore Mm. and I can't have that around me anymore. But I know that you're a person who loves us and we love you. Like it's okay to speak from a place of I can love you where you're at and I can ask for what I need. Mm. What would you offer? I'm I'm just like so wrapped up in those words. Yeah, and I would also really invite you to practice just the nervous system regulation that is likely needed as you even hear Julie say that Mm. because there will be bits of you going like I kind of can't and you'll you'll hear certain words that you might close on when you imagine yourself saying those. And so if you have memories that pop up for you as you think about that from times in the past where you were in conflict, I would really invite you to go back to those memories and find the gifts of those experiences, Mm. the benefits in those moments and the drawbacks to you and your relationship with your family if they hadn't happened or if it had been a different way, a better way that you somehow think um, it could have been. Because part of going back in the past and seeing wider will give you the anchoring and the alignment to move forward. Because mm. our fear is, has already happened. It's a buildup of past experience in our awareness. Mm. And so the practice is how can I make it safe in my body mm. and my mind to move toward this? and blast past all of the stuff in the way, the stories that I tell myself that make it impossible for me to do that or impossible for them to do that, right? We're either saying I can't or they can't. It's one of the two. Mm. So how can we? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. God, yeah. And how do we have an expanded version of what it is to love? Because mm. it doesn't always look like connection and softness, right? Yeah. But sometimes it also looks like I love you enough to call you into deeper integrity. Mm. Because that is love. Yeah. And until someone points something out to us, we can't see it in ourselves. Mm. So we're likely all walking around doing the thing that because no one's had the guts to tell us otherwise and we haven't never seen it. Mm. Yeah. And that was, and, and like I can, I can just think of so many examples of that in my world and, and we think that we're helping that person by doing that, but we're not. No, we're not. We're just helping ourselves. Yeah. But at the same time creating harm still. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so, I, you know, I totally all of us, I think, can collectively feel how deep and hard and heavy it is. No one's taking this conversation lightly. No. But the more we have this conversation and practice beyond the place we stop, 
Yes. The more safe it becomes to enter. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And how do we love through the hard stuff, not just when you're convenient for me? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. So, dear listener, we really hope that this lands somewhere for you and feels empowering and offers a pathway forward for where you feel stuck and hopefully I'm sure helps other listeners in in similar Mm -hmm. dynamics because we're all there in some form, right? That's that's family and that's growth. Yeah, totally, totally. So if you're ready to dive into this work, I would also say to you to check out Tara Bourne as well. So we'll put her details in here because she does hold incredible accountability in spaces of deep learning. And to connect with you, Bridget. It's bridgetwood.life. And, and you- what have you got going on at the moment, girlfriend? Yeah, what's coming up is Disrupt, Revealing the Mother Wound. So it will touch on aspects of this in there as well. So really looking at what we come with, looking at the stories and the narratives that we think is, is the truth, right, and unravelling those and finding our expansion within mothering ourselves, mothering our children and our relationship with our mother too. So that begins on the 18th of October. What about you, Jules? You can connect with me at julietenner.love and you can jump into Honey Club at the moment. It's my monthly membership. Or you can, and or, you can hang on out for Lover School, which is about another four weeks away. So more details on that to come. Exciting. Mm. Remember to nourish the woman to rock the family. And I'll see you next, whoa, I'll see you next week. What do I say? We'll see you next week. I just had a total mental blank. Oh, my Lord. And we'll see you next week when we continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey. Thank you so much for listening. We literally couldn't do this without you. Please share this podcast with anyone you think it would be medicine for. If you desire to integrate your learnings practically and supportively into your life, then head on over to bridgetwood.life or Julie Tenner dot love to go deeper and if you feel like giving back a little to this free content please rate us on itunes or facebook all of which helps the podcast reach more mamas who need this type of tonic for the soul this has been a production of the wellnesscouch.com check us out on facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com for slash the wellness couch Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.